Hello and welcome to the Lockdown Lit Fest and in particular to this conversation. My name is Julia Wheeler and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome one of the UK's most popular crime writers to the festival today. Uh, Mark Billingham, welcome to Lockdown. Um, 2020 is massive for you and for D.I. Thorne, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. It's, I think it's fairly massive for everybody uh, for all the wrong reasons right now. But uh, yeah, it was certainly set to be um, a big year, an anniversary year for me. Yeah. And, and how much are you managing to, to keep up that spirit and how much are you having to change and be flexible with what actually is possible at the moment? Oh, obviously you, ha you have to be hugely flexible. I mean, I'm, I'm getting used to this. I'm getting used to to virtual events, um, which is great as long as there's some way to do them because I just love doing events. Um, for me, writing the books is the job and getting to show off and talk about them is, is, is the perk. I've, all, I've always really enjoyed it. So I'm missing, I'm missing live audiences enormously, but you know, this is great that we found another way to do it. Yeah, it is. And it's wonderful for us to be here today because this is the first time that you're actually talking about your new novel, which is coming out um, in July, Cry Baby, which is a prequel. Yes. Tell us about it. Yes. Well, because it is the 20th book and it's 20 years of Thorn, um, we wanted to do something a bit, a bit different. So um, we're, we're going with uh, a prequel to the first book. So I've gone back in time to... Uh, the mid nineties, um, which is interesting. I mean, it's great on one hand because it means I'm uh, uh, writing about a time where there's no, mo you know, mobile phones aren't everywhere and there's no CCTV and there's no internet. And, you know, all the police, the police didn't have external email. The most technologically advanced thing that, that Tom Thorne's got in this book is a pager. You know, not even, not even one of those pages that, that, that has text on it, just beeps. And it has to go to a phone box and call in and go, yes, you wanted me. Um, uh, I hate those. They were the worst of every world, weren't they? <laughs> People could get in touch with you, but then it was really inconvenient because you had to call them back. Yeah, absolutely. So he has to pick up a phone wherever he is. Um, so that bit of it is fun. Um, and even though it's a period that I remember really well, it's set largely due the, due, during the Euro 96 uh, football tournament. And I remember kind of every moment of that. But it still felt like I was writing a historical novel. You know, to, to be writing about a time where... If you wanted to find out how to get somewhere, you had an A to Z. And if you wanted to get photos developed, you took them to a chemist. You know, which seems like ancient history now, even though it's only, you know, 10 minutes ago. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I had to do quite a lot of research. I had a, uh, a very good uh, advisor called Graham Bartlett, who's uh, an ex-DCI who was working at that time. Uh, he, he helps out a lot of crime writers. So he was very helpful. He would literally send me pictures of what... Um, I mean, the police had a really rudimentary mobile phone at that time that they would take to, you know, out of the way locations, in this case, some woods, um, which is this weird kind of Heath Robinson thing that takes about three people to carry and stuff. Uh, and Thorne has, you know, or either I, I have great fun having Thorne say, you know, these things are never going to catch on. Um, I think so, what yeah. you actually say is... I'm not going to use the word, but I'll maybe let you use it. But they're for the seriously minted and yeah. other idiots. Yes, yes. I mean, he's seen a few. By this time, Thorne has seen a few. He's even been in a couple of cars that have got uh, mobile phones attached to them with curly wires, you know. Um, but, yeah, he's, he, he doesn't think they're ever going to catch on. And CCTV is in, his, in its infancy. At that time, I think the John Major government decided to spend a huge amount of, of the, the, the crime budget on installing these CCTV cameras. But they were just there to catch shoplifters or people smoking weed in doorways or trying to steal cars. You know, nobody ever thought they'd be a, a serious weapon in fighting crime. So they have got DNA and they've got the new Holmes uh, computer system, and yeah. which they're sort of grappling with. Did you also need to think about the the attitudes that the police have then compared to now in terms of investigating crime? Yes, I mean, Holmes, Holmes came in um, largely as a result of the, of the fiasco of the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry. Um, well, you know, I say fiasco, it was, it, well, it was a fiasco, but they were just overwhelmed by, by paperwork. I mean, at one point, I'm fairly, fairly confident that this is true, that the actual floor of the major incident room of the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry had to be reinforced just because there were so many, you know, filing cabinets full of this stuff. So they're starting to get into the computer era of trying to do all this stuff properly. Um, I'm, I'm less interested in, in the procedure. I mean, I, 
I kind of needed some help on it because I, I had to get certain things right. But for me, it's all about the character of, of Tom Thorne. It always has been. And um, I was now writing about a, a much younger man, a man whose parents are both alive, um, uh, a man who is not quite as scarred as he is in, you know, last year's book. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot of fun to take him back in time. And I get the impression that it was also a lot of fun to see the first meeting between him and Phil Hendricks. And there wasn't the word bromance back in 1996, but I think that's really what it was fairly, fairly early on, wasn't it? Well, fairly, fairly early on, and it's, uh, it's certainly a bromance now. And, and those scenes are always the scenes I enjoy writing the most. I mean, I, I love that character. Um, and so, you know, putting him and Thorne in a room is always fun. And yet, yeah, this is the first time they ever meet. Uh, and it's safe to say they don't, they don't hit it off straight away. <laughs> <laughs> which uh, which I had, I had a lot of fun with that. Um, it's nice putting those little Easter eggs in, those little moments uh, that, that people that have read all the books, and really, you know, why don't you get a life, get out, there's lots of other books out there. Um, but God bless you. Um, and those that have read all the books will go, oh, I know what that is, and I know where that's going to go, and, and that's, that's one of the joys of writing a prequel. I guess for 20 years you've been thinking, I well tell me have you been thinking um well I must remember what happened then and I must make sure that he's true to the character and so on how much how different is it to go back and sort of sow seeds how much retrofitting was there oh it's really hard because I don't keep all those details I don't have a dossier of facts on Thorne I never have that's one of the things I decided early on was that the reader was going to know as much about him book on book as as, as I did um so yeah I'll occasionally get emails going why are his eyes brown in book six and then you know green in book 12 um and in fact I'm going back as I say to a time when his mother was alive by the time of the first Thorn novel Sleepyhead uh his mother had recently died so I'm suddenly writing about his mother is and I had to go and ask my wife what what his mother's name was I completely forgotten um <laughs> But I, I prefer it that way because there's more, there's sort of more chance of surprising myself and therefore surprising the reader. Um, in terms of, let's, let's talk about the story actually, because it grabs you right from the very beginning. Just, just, te- just sort of, um, give us a, um, a, a taste or a flavour, if you like, of the plot. Well, it just starts with um, two, two mothers and their, and their sons playing in, in the park in North London. And, you know, the kids go running off into, into the woods, the board of the playground, and only one of them comes back. And uh, it's, in a way, there's, there's, there's always much more at stake when, in a way, when there's somebody missing rather than a body. I mean, trust me, there are bodies later on in the book. Um, I'm contractually obliged to do that. Uh, but, but, but Thorne, but Thorne is, trying, is trying to find out what's happened to this, to this missing boy. Um, and of course, we also spend an awful lot of time with the missing boy's mother and with the mother of the boy who isn't missing. Um, and it's what happens to their relationship. And uh, yeah, all sorts of all sorts of weird. And, you know, people start dying who are connected somehow to it. And Thorne's got to try and figure out exactly what's going on. It's very interesting, actually, having that backdrop of the 1996 um, football championship. It would be the Euros, I think, isn't it? Yes. Um, and also particularly interesting because Thorne Boss at that time, he, so Thorne is a DS, but his DI is Scottish. Yes, yes, and <laughs> not not the most pleasant of Scotsmen. Uh, they don't they don't really get on anyway, and and that relationship tends to suffer uh, lar- largely due to one memorable football match when Scotland played England. <laughs> There's a whole chapter during during uh, the playing of that match, and they're all they're all watching it in the pub. And in fact, one of the, one of the things I had to change about the book very late on, very late on, because of the, the lockdown and because of the pandemic, uh, was there's a chapter right at the very end set in the present day. And it's set on the eve of the European Football Championships 2020, which of course never happened um, because they've been cancelled because of the pandemic. So that was a, a last minute panicky rewrite. The latest paperback um, that you you got out is uh, their little secret, which came out at the beginning of the year, and I have to say went straight into um, Sunday Times bestsellers list at number one. So congratulations on that! Thank you, hooray! <laughs> Absolutely. So that that's um, uh, it's a it's a very uh, different book. He's as you say a different person. He has different people that he's working with. Um, tell us about Nicola Tanner. 
Well, she, she was a character that, that appeared in a standalone novel uh, that I wrote a few years ago called Die of Shame. Um, and I wanted to create a character who was very much the anti-thorn, you know, a copper who loved paperwork and order and, and would never dream of, of breaking a rule or arguing with a senior officer or anything like that. Very much to be everything Thorne wasn't. And I very much enjoyed writing about her so much that I, she then bled into the series. And, and eventually I thought, well, wouldn't it be a lot of fun to put her and Tanner together to get matter and antimatter colliding and uh, see what happened. And it's very much become a double act now. In fact, Their Little Secret, I think, is the first book that was sort of billed on the front as a Thorn and Tanner thriller. Um, they're very different characters. They have a very strange relationship. They're, and they become sort of bonded together by, by, by something that, that happens. Um, they have their own little secret. They have, indeed have their own little secret, very dark little secret, which, which binds them together. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to carry on writing about her for a long time, I think. Is it important at the moment within the publishing world and the conversations that you have with your editors and agents and so on to have a feisty female, particularly if you are male and writing? Well, I mean, it's never, it's never something I've specifically talked to anybody about. And, and, and I have a pet hate of the, of the whole feisty thing. You know, I mean, Nicola's, Nicola's kind of anything but feisty, really. Um, but she knows very much how to handle him, doesn't she? Oh, she knows how to, she knows how to handle him, um, but she has you know she has her own problems. I mean, I, I I'm not really interested in writing about any character who is who is perfect. Um, you know, Thorn Thorn in many ways is a terrible police officer, um, and you know I'm not sure he's someone I'd want to spend an awful lot of time with. Uh, you know, he has an awful lot that's 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 wrong with him. But you know, which, which of us is perfect, and and which of us is heroic all the time and does the right thing all the time, and neither of them do. Um, uh, but it but it's fun putting them together. It's fun giving giving uh, a character or somebody to bounce off. You know, they're both not in uniform, but I wonder whether they were in uniform and policing the current situation. How would they be reacting to it in terms of? Um, Letting people get on with things or dishing out fines? Oh, I think Nicola would be dishing out fines uh, and, and writing them all down in, in a notebook and keeping a, a, a record of them and typing them up when she got back to the office and then putting them in a computer. And, and Thorne would just be kicking the idiots up the arse, I think, um, and telling them to, to get back indoors. Uh, and that's, to be honest, the kind of copper I'd quite like to have around right now. I was going to say, I mean, how, how much of you is there in Thorn when you say that? Oh, there's a lot. I mean, well, I mean, we have the same birthday and we both support an ailing football team and we're both obsessed with curry and country music. Um, beyond that, I mean, I kind of wish I was more like Thorn in some ways. I wish it was as brave as Thorn and, you know, could do some of the things that he can do just because he's got a warrant card. Uh, but that, that, that's kind of where the similarity... I mean... If he's getting an opinion off his chest about, I don't know, the NHS or the state of public transport or whatever it might be, do you know what? That's probably me. Uh, it probably is. You've got 400 pages of the novel. You can, you can afford to have a little rant now and again. Um, and yeah, he's probably, he's probably a lot closer to me than, than I'd care to admit. He's not, I'm way happier than he is. I mean, as, as, as his life has fallen apart, mine has just got better and better. <laughs> I, owe him, I owe him a lot, let's say. One of the threads that runs through it from the, the prequel right through to, to the present day, Thorne, is his um, hatred of creative writing teachers, which comes, of course, <laughs> from his wife running off with one. Yeah. Um, that's... How much of you is kind of like, oh, this creative writing enough already, just crack on? Um, well, a little bit of that. I mean, I, I did a, I did a, a tiny bit of, of the creative writing course bef before I started the first book. Um, and I ended, up, I ended up just sounding an awful lot like the people I was reading. I mean, I think that's one of, the, one of the problems. You know, you go away and you read a lot of Ernest Hemingway and you start writing these choppy, muscular little sentences or then you read somebody who, who, who's a much more sort of lush and sensuous writer and your sentences get longer and longer. And I think it just, it takes you an awful long time to find your own voice. And I think the only way to do that is to, is to sit down and do it. Um, the other problem I think that happens now with creative writing courses online is that uh, there can be an awful lot of nastiness. There can be quite an awful lot of bitchiness when, when it comes to, to newer writers sharing their work with fellow new writers. Um, I, think you've, I think you've got to be wary. I mean, obviously, it's very important to share your work. You've got to show it to people. That's one of the most important steps, uh, is letting other people 
um, look at your work and then confirm that little voice in your head that says, oh, you know, those three chapters in the middle, I'm treading water there, I don't need them, or I need to make that clearer, or I need to expand on this character a bit more. But, but doing it online with a bunch of strangers can be quite tricky. You've just, you've just got to tread carefully, I think. And so who are the people that you have as first readers? Um, well, I have, I have two, I th- I have three first readers bef- before it's submitted. I mean, I, I, I finish a first draft and nobody has seen a word of it. And then I show it to my wife, who doesn't really read much crime fiction. I read it to my friend Wendy, who reads everything to do with crime fiction. And I send it to my agent. And then I get notes from all three of them. And uh, Wendy is very good on the crime stuff. She, you know, she'll always go, hang on a minute. If, they, if this was a Wednesday, how would they have got the DNA results by it? You know, or there's a huge hole in the plot there, or whatever it might be. My wife will pick me up on other stuff. My agent will pick me up on other stuff. Um, so I take those three lots of notes on board. I do another draft, and then I submit it. And I won't submit it to my editor until, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit OCD about it. I copy edit myself. I know which phrases I overuse, uh, which little verbal ticks I have. So uh, I, I go through the manuscript, weeding all that stuff out. So by the time I've actually delivered the book, if there's a typo in it, I, you know, I'm, I'm a basket case for days. Um, I, I want to deliver a very clean version of it. And how are you finding it writing at the moment? I mean, obviously, I, lots of authors are saying, actually, life isn't that different for us because we are at home we're sitting there in front of the computer and writing but how much are you able to block out what is going on around and and is any of that seeping into what you're writing at the moment well you you can't block it out i mean i I understand it when people say uh your life isn't very different because you spend most of every day mooching about the house in a ratty dressing gown and pajamas so what's what's different well your mindset is different because of what's happening outside how can it not be um that said i'm i'm writing tons i mean i'm i'm three quarters of the way through the next book, which is way ahead of schedule. Um, having said that, at the end of every day, I kind of look at what I've written and go, kind of, what's the point? You know, <laughs> it's just a novel. Um, and, and you look at what's happening outside and it makes, it makes what you're doing seem a bit insignificant, because uh, it is a bit insignificant. It's just a crime novel. Um, but I'm finding, I'm finding that I'm writing much quicker and writing much longer. I'm less distracted by... Um, you know, I'm, I'm less distracted by day-to-day stuff, but then you see the news at the end of the day and go, oh, crunky. Um, so your mindset is very different, but yeah, there's, there's certainly plenty of time to write. And are you including coronavirus? Does it work to include it, or it works actually to keep it out of the, the next... I, I am keeping it... I am keeping it... I mean, I'm not denying that it's happened. Um, the, book, the book is largely set... Well, completely set in a hospital, uh, but a very special kind of hospital... I don't want to say much about the book at all, other than it's a standalone and it's largely set in a hospital. Um, so it's, it's impossible not to refer to it, not to talk about, you know, applauding the NHS, that kind of stuff, make a few little points about that stuff. But I'm not, I'm not referencing it all the time. Uh, I think you have to take, you either have to reference it all the time or kind of ignore it. I, I don't think there's a middle ground. I think it's very tricky. Uh, I'm, it's also not set in any specific time. You know, I'm not saying it's April 2021 or it's whenever it is, because that's where you can get into trouble because real events such as this, especially if they're global events, catch up with you and, and your book becomes very dated very quickly. And if people are in that uh, situation where they have the time and they have the inclination to um, sit and write, what advice would you give them if they're planning the sort of novel that, that you write in terms of plotting and voice and pace and just, just give us a sort of a sense of how to? Well, I think, you know, as you know, if you asked 100 writers, you'd get 100 different answers, Julia. Uh, and I'm certainly writing a bit differently than I did when I started. I used to be a mass, very, uh, very concerned with research. Oh, I was crazy for research you know i would drive to a set of traffic lights at three in the morning to check you could turn left so i didn't want to get that wrong you know really i mean you don't want to get those letters going dear mr billingham you know my enjoyment of your otherwise excellent novel was spoiled by the fact that that train does not stop in fact at that station on wednesday in the front oh you know <laughs> um you're always going to get you're always going to get people pointing stuff out and that's fine you learn to research the stuff that really matters rather than researching everything um, and also I've learned that for me plotting isn't that important which I know sounds very strange in a crime novel when, when 
plots uh, always seem to be so important. But for me now, I just have an opening scene. I, you know, in, in Crybaby, I had that opening scene with the mothers in a park. And at the end of it, you go, huh, what, why, who? And I just want to answer those questions as I go. I, I, I don't want to know the answers. Uh, I don't want the readers to know the answers. I don't want Thorne to know the answers. And we'll all sort of discover them at the same time. I mean, yes, I'm seeing a couple of chapters ahead. I'm sort of, and by the time I'm halfway through the book, I kind of have an ending in sight. But it's a very circuitous journey through fog. And I can only see as far as the end of my headlights. One of the things I love about your books is that you are in and out of people's points of view. I mean, that's right from the beginning with Sleepy Head, um, which was such an original way to, to, to write a book. And there have been plenty of people who've uh, imitated that um, since. But how do you, um, well, both in terms of writing, do you write chronologically in terms of the chapters that they'll, they'll appear? Or do you stay in one person's head and sort of sort that part of the plot out before you move things yeah, about? Yeah, I, I wish I did. I wish I did. I think what you've just suggested, you know, the second thing you suggested would be a far more sensible way to do it. But I, do, I just can't do that. I have to go chronologically. Um, I can't, I cannot write chapter two unless I'm absolutely happy with chapter one. And that goes for every sentence and every paragraph and... I can't just go, you know, rush forward like a shark, have to keep moving. Um, and, and that thing of getting inside other people's heads, that's the joy of it for me. That's, and it comes from having a performance background and an acting background and loving being inside other people's heads and stepping inside their shoes and just being them for a, a couple of chapters and then being somebody else, you know. Uh, it, there's just much more variety. If I go, oh, next chapter, I'm going to be a 12-year-old boy. That's, you know, that's, that's all, that's the fun of it for me. Let's take you back to your prequel in 1996. What were you doing? Um, I was, well, I was watching Euro 96. Um, I, gosh, what was I doing in 1996? Um, well, I'd got a, a, a one-year-old. Uh, a one-year-old child. I was still doing stand-up comedy, uh, which was pretty tough with a one-year-old when you're, when you're getting back from the comedy store at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, and then, you know... Uh, you got to look after a, or help help look after a, a, a one year old or whatever it might be. Uh, just about to have a, another child, um, so yeah, it was it was a busy time. It was a busy time, um, but I was I was really it, it, I was starting to get a bit jumpy. I think about about stand up at that point. I'd been doing it for a while and it was fine. I, it was a job I really enjoyed, and I was traveling all over the world and doing it and. and but it's it's a tricky it's a tricky job to do when you've got a young family. Uh, were you were you one of the men in tights at that stage? One of the men in tights? <laughs> oh, have you been finding out about me, Julia? You know what I'm talking about. No, I don't. Well, I'm thinking about um, uh, Tony Robinson and, and the crew. Oh, those tights. Those tights. Yes, they see. Those tights. Oh, you get away with it. Yes. No. 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 Oh uh, gosh, had that finished by then? Um, yes, I think that had finished by then. This was, this was a, a, a TV series called Made Marion and Merry Men that I acted in for four or five years. Where, yes, I got to run around. I wouldn't say they were tights. They were, they were more like Hessian leggings. Oh, it's so itchy. Oh, it was. It was very itchy and chain mail. And, uh, but a big sword. I got to run around in a forest uh, with a big sword being Tony Robinson's henchman. Um, he was playing the sheriff of Nottingham and uh, it was a great show. It was a great show. And in fact, was the show that led me to become a writer, really. Because at that time I was a jobbing actor. And by the end of that series, we did four series, I'd started writing for it. So by the time that show finished, I'd, I'd become a television writer. Um, and I did that for a few years and largely hated it, I've got to say. Um, and then thought, well, I'm a writer and what do I love? Crime fiction. Mm, let's have a go. On holiday, I believe it was, wasn't it? It was, yeah, I was on holiday. And I'd always, you know, I'd written a lot of stuff by then. I'd written, you know, stuff for television and stuff for stand-up and terrible plays and poems and whatever it might be. But I'd always fought shy of trying to write a novel because they just looked like house bricks to me. You know, I just thought, how much work is that? How thick are these books? Um, that's such a lot of work. And then I would sit outside this, this villa in Corfu, wherever we were with the family, that uh, that summer, and I just started scribbling in a notebook and, and starting to write this story, which would eventually become Sleepyhead. And by the end of the holiday, I sort of did a word count and went, hang on, I've done about 30,000 words. That's about a third of a novel. And I started to think maybe it wasn't as, as you know, daunting as I thought it was. 
And I came home and I tarted those 30,000 words up and I sent them off to an agent and I got an agent and the agent sent them off to some publishers and a bunch of publishers wanted, and I got a book deal. I got my book deal on those 30,000 words that I'd, I'd written on holiday, um, which is not the way it's supposed to be. You know, that's, that's having a phenomenal amount of good luck. Um, and yeah, that was it. I was often, I was often running. We can't let you go without talking about the sort of full circle side of things and you coming back to the stage. Tell us about um, the fun-loving crime writers <laughs> and what uh -huh. you're going to do. Well, um, this, this was, um, yes, so many writers are frustrated uh, rock stars. Um, what basically there was a there's a, a crime writer convention that happens in a different city every year in america and a couple of years ago it was in new orleans uh, and on the last night there was a sort of open mic night at a, at a famous venue called the house of blues in new orleans with a sort of scratch band and people could get up and do a bit and i was there with two other uh writers doug johnston scotch writer and Stuart neville uh, the irish writer and we planned to get up and do a bit and then forgot about it and just started drinking heavily and at the end of the night, this band finished and, and, and this woman from the stage went, where are the Brits? Get the Brits up here. And myself and Stuart and Doug went, oh, crikey, and stumbled up and plucked, busked our way through a few songs, which were Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash, Werewolves of London by Warren Zevon, and for reasons I still don't understand, 500 Miles by The Proclaimers. Oh, um, yeah. And it went surprisingly well, I think, because the audience had, had as much to drink as we had. Um, and as is the way of these things, it wound up on YouTube and suddenly we were being asked to do an hour and a half at the Edinburgh Book Festival. And we went, oh, we've only got three songs and there's only three of us. And we very quickly put this band together. We got Val McDermid and we got Chris Brookmeyer and we got Luca Veste. And we put this band together and we rehearsed and it sounded okay. And we did this show at Edinburgh and it went really well. And to cut a long story short, you know, last summer we played at Glastonbury. And it started off as just a bit of fun. and. Suddenly we're doing these, these big shows and, um, you know, the, one of the, the saddest things for us about the, the lockdown, the pandemic and stuff is all the shows we've had to cancel. We had a whole bunch of gigs lined up in uh, May and June and July, something very special that this year's Edinburgh Festival we're going to be doing. And, uh, but we will do those shows again and, you know, we, we meet up on Zoom and talk about, we're going to do a bit, little bit of acoustic -y, bit of unplugged stuff online, I think, but no, it's, oh, it's such a treat because... Writing is such a solitary job, obviously, so being able to do stuff collaborative, collaboratively and jump about on stage, showing off with five mates and, and uh, yeah, living out, living out those teenage rock star fantasies is, is just such fun. You say in your acknowledgements um, to Cry Baby, we'll always have Glastonbury. Just give us a sense of the ten well, I imagine it was tension. Give us a sense of the atmosphere behind the scenes just before you played that stage. Oh, well, it's the kind of thing you joke about. If you're in a band, you joke about it. You go, well, you know, when we're playing Glastonbury. And it's also the sort of thing other people take the mickey out of you for. They go, oh, when are you playing Glastonbury? And I was the one that got the email. I got the email. Or there was a phone call. I got a phone call that said, you know, do you guys want to play Glastonbury? So I was the one that got to send the email to the rest of the band saying, this is not a joke. We, we've been asked to play. And they still wouldn't believe me. They were going, yeah, 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 yeah. So when it, fi honestly, when it finally came, I, all except one of us, the bass player, Luca, was thrilled. He was just, he went, went on like he didn't have a care in the world. The rest of us were a bit like, we better not mess this up. This is Glastonbury. We're playing the acoustic stage, which is a big old tent. You know, I don't know, five or 6,000 people tent. Um, and it went fine, it was great. But the following, we got booked for a, a few festivals that summer, and the following weekend we were doing another festival in Cornbury, in Gloucestershire, and that I adored. Because I thought, we've done this once, we've done this, we can do this, we can play on a big stage, outdoor, in front of thousands of people in a field. Um, and it was just glorious, it was glorious. But just the best thing about Glastonbury, the best little thing, was you have this backstage area, um, and there's all these fridges lined up for each band. With, with the band's name on. And uh, because I was, I, I say, I was the one that got the phone call. I was the one that had to deal with things like the rider, right? And I didn't want to be pushy because I thought, we're playing Glastonbury, let's not push it. So I just said, oh, get a few beers and a, and a bottle of wine. And I don't know whether you, whether you remember, but that summer was bakingly hot. It was so hot at Glastonbury. So a good hour before we do on stage, we drunk all our beer. Um, and so we started looking in all the other band's fridges. And there's like Hawkwind, Hawkwind's fridge. And Hawkwind's fridge is just full, just completely. Have you see? And I remember the, the, my guitarist, or our guitarist being very cross that we drank all our beer. Going, Have you seen what's in Hawkwind's fridge? And there were, I don't know, 
48 bottles of beer and, and tequila and gin and vodka. And so we're, we're a bit pushier on the riders now. But that was very, very exciting, seeing our name on a fridge. I can imagine, I can only imagine. And I want so much for that to happen soon. The next oh, yeah. cluster for you, the next whatever to, to be up there, as I'm, as I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Um, Mark, oh. thank you so much for, for being here today and, and sharing those stories and telling us about how you are now and plans and wish you every luck with um, the re-release of The Sleepy Head, the new novel which comes out in paperback, uh, in July, which is Cry Baby, and uh, Their Little Secret, which is now out in paperback. Thanks so much for being part of the lockdown lit fest today. It's been brilliant to see you, and I can't wait to see you in person again soon. Yeah, back at you, Julia, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you, and thank you very much for watching the lockdown lit fest. Do please subscribe to the email newsletter, donate if you'd like to, and please keep checking back because there are loads more conversations uh, to keep us all going through this time. Thanks very much for being here.